And with that, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Los Angeles Birders webinar for March 14th. Thank you all very much for coming. And thank you, especially thank you for all of you who are members of Los Angeles Birders. We appreciate your support. And if you're not a member yet of Los Angeles Birders, please consider becoming a member. It's, uh, it's not expensive to be a member at all. And we appreciate your numbers and your contributions. It, go, it all goes into helping put on these webinars and helping to, uh, to do everything we need to do, keep the lights on, as they say. Uh, let's see here. And with that, I think I think I need to introduce or want to introduce Kimmel Garrett, who is a former board member of Los Angeles Birders and hopefully a future board member of LA Birders. And Kimball will be introducing our speaker for tonight. Kimball. Okay, thanks, Ron. And I'm very pleased to do so to introduce Dr. Young Ha Su. Uh, as many of you know, Dr. Su is the Ornithology Collections Manager at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. She assumed that position in July of last year, 2022, bringing with her an impressive set of skills, many of which were sorely lacking in her predecessor. Um, Young <laughs> received her undergraduate degree in wildlife biology at the University of California at Davis, and then earned her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology at Cornell University. You'll be hearing tonight about her dissertation work where Young studied dispersal decisions in the cooperatively breeding uh, Florida scrub jay using long-term data collected there um, in Florida and field collected data, as well as newly developed tracking technology to study movement leading up to dispersal. Young's research interests in, is in behavioral ecology and animal movement studies. She's also passionate about education and outreach, and she's gonna give us a little more insight about her background during her talk tonight. So again, please welcome Dr. Young Hasa, as she talks tonight on what makes you move, studying movement patterns in the social Florida scrub jay. Young, take it away. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Kimball. Humble as ever. Um, and thank you so much for having me today. Let me share a screen. Hopefully everyone. Looking great, thank you. Okay, cool, awesome. Yeah, so like people said, I'll be talking about my dissertation work that I did on the floor scrub jays. Um, but yeah, I'd like to give a little bit of background of sort of how I got here. Um, so uh, this is just an aerial photo of my hometown. So maybe similar to many of you who live in LA, grew up in a fairly urban environment, you know, lots of these really tall apartment buildings. Um, you can see a lot of like trees here, but for the most part, it's very urban. Um, the camera's on. And, oh, sorry, can you hear me? Can I see my screen? Okay, <laughs> I'm assuming yes. Uh, but yeah, ever since I was a child, for whatever reason, I was really drawn to animals. I never really got to see animals in the wild. Most of my encounters, I guess, were at the zoo or watching nature documentaries. Um, so when I got this incredible privilege and opportunity to study at UC Davis, I really jumped at that opportunity. And like Kimbo mentioned, I was in the wildlife conservation uh, biology department, and I just had such a wonderful time. This was the first time I got to do field work. I got to touch animals, interact with them, and you know, I got to learn that you know, I can make a living working with wild animals. So it was really a big game changer for me. So um, at, when I got to at Davis, I was just you know, threw myself at any internship opportunity, any field research opportunity there was. Um, and between undergrad and grad school, I took a year, sort of a gap year, um, working on meerkats in South Africa with the Kalahari Meerkat Project. Um, but, you know, while I was engaged in, you know, these different research topics and different settings, um, I sort of came upon like a common theme. So these are the three, I guess, main species that I worked with. So the wood ducks at Davis, the meerkats in South Africa, and also American crows at Davis. Um, the part that intrigued me the most was that, um, you know, even especially with these long term projects is that even in these you know, typical animals, there seems to be a lot of variation in how individuals sort of decide on what to do with their 
life uh, history, basically. So um, thinking about, you know, in terms of when they decide to leave their home, uh, how far they move afterwards, um, all these different decisions, I uh, really wanted to understand, like, why was there so much variation in that? Um, and sort of here, when I say life history, these are sort of key events that influence an organism's what we call fitness, uh, in, involving survival and uh, life, lifetime reproductive success. And um, throughout you know, my experiences, I learned that there's a lot of trade-offs going on that are very unique to each system. Um, and so within these life history decisions, uh, one of my main research interests were, was natal dispersal. So this is the movement from natal territory to breeding territory, which is a crucial yet complex process that underlies many ecological and evolutionary processes from the population to individual level through mechanisms like gene flow, you know, where the individuals contain the genes, they're, sort of, they're literally moving to a different location also affects population dynamics and at get the individual level, it affects their fitness. And dispersal is uh, comprised of these multiple steps from leaving home to sort of looking around for suitable territories and then finally settling in one to breed at. And these are affected by both internal and external conditions of the disperser. Uh, despite its importance as a life history trait, dispersal has often been regarded as a random process because it's just so difficult to track individual animal movement. Um, but like I said, there are these cost benefits that sh uh, shape individual dispersal decisions at each of these steps. And while dispersal itself is essentially access to breeding opportunities being the main sort of benefit of, of doing this all uh, doing all of this, it's also thought to incur costs that might prevent individuals from all dispersing sort of in an optimal manner. So these costs can include the energetics of the movement itself, aggression from conspecifics, and like you see with this pheasant, um, the predation risks of being in an unfamiliar area. In addition, some systems show even more variation in dispersal decisions, especially in uh, what we call cooperative breeders, where the offspring can delay dispersal, which further complicates our understanding of how and why dispersal occurs. So when I say cooperative breeders, I'm referring to social systems in which multiple individuals provide parental care uh, to one single brood. Um, and there are many hypotheses as to why and how the system has evolved, but they seem to be fairly species uh, dependent, but generally helpers are the ones that forego their own reproduction. Um, they seem to have these distinct benefits and costs. So on one hand, by staying at home, um, helpers are in what we call safe havens, which sort of protect them from ecological constraints that prevent them from dispersing and breeding independently themselves. They may also benefit from uh, parental nepotism where parents provide extended support and care towards their offspring as opposed to unrelated group members. And in many cases, they benefit from indirect fitness where they're still getting some genetic benefit because they're helping out their siblings or, uh, and their parents. But on the other hand, um, helping helpers also lose breeding opportunities because again, they are delaying breeding by doing so and they may die while they're sort of waiting for that breeding opportunity at home. And in certain conditions, kin may act as competitors, especially when there are limited resources on the natal territory. So again, helpers also need to weigh these costs and benefits uh, when it comes to them deciding whether to stay to help or disperse and breed. So for my dissertation, I sort of uh, reached, uh, wanted to understand uh, sort of three main questions when it came to dispersal and proper breeders. So uh, first is how does dispersal vary among different individuals or within the same species? Um, and uh, sort of going ahead of myself, uh, there were these two distinct types of dispersal pattern and this for scrub which I'll talk to you about later, but I want to understand you know, why that was happening. And last, I want to uh, study prospecting behavior, which is the movement preceding dispersal. But again, I'll get to these questions uh, one by one. So um, if it wasn't clear already, I studied variation and dispersal in flora scrub jays, which are habitat specialists residing in oak scrub patches of Florida. They are year-round resident species that defend their territories permanently. 
And most importantly, they're considered sort of a classical cooperative breeding system in which the young stay at home for at least one year uh, as they help raise the young of their, uh, of their parents. So it's usually their siblings or half siblings. And they also uh, help defend the territory, uh, stay on sentinel for the rest of the group and so forth. Um, this species is also of conservation concern with their range diminishing and fragmenting due to human development and land use changes in Florida, as you can imagine. Um, but all this makes it really pertinent to understand how dispersal may occur, especially as these habitat patches become more fragmented and they need to cross further distances. Um, one key feature of their ecology is their adaptation to fire and subsequently the importance of having really large territories. So Florida is considered the lightning capital of the US. So it has the most lightning strikes um, in the continent. And because of that, there's just a lot of wildfires occurring naturally. So pretty similar to the California system here. Um, but with, with fire, uh, after about two to five years post like a major burn, the uh, Florida oak scrub tends to produce a lot more acorns, which attracts the scrub jays. You can see here, this is one um, experimental plot that we uh, were able to time the burn frequency. So um, as you can see, as soon as the fire occurs, the population sort of dec uh, declines, but soon starts to increase, as you can see in this. Um, if I can use this pen or the corner here. Um, it starts to increase after two to five years post burn. And then after around like 10 years, actually the territory or the habitat quality declines because it gets too overgrown. So the uh, reproductive success actually declines in the scrub jays um, until another fire comes in and then the population bounces back again. Um, so yeah, uh, and it's seemingly because of this uh, importance of fire, Florida scrub jays tend to uh, have uh, really large territories for their body size. So just to compare it to the other two Aphalocoma jays that we're familiar with here, the Florida scrub jays is about 75 grams and their territories are on average eight to 10 hectares. In contrast that to the California scrub jays, which are slightly larger, but only have you know, a, a quarter of the territories and more so in the island scrub jays, which are almost twice the size of, as Florida scrub jays, but have much smaller territories. So uh, it seems like this, these large territories sort of act as insurance. So preventing, uh, by having large territories, it uh, prevents from fires uh, burning through the entire tract and resulting in zero acorn production. Um, and because of that, it seems like uh, that's why they're so uh, focused on defending large territories. Okay. Um, and I conducted all my research on a uh, long-term color banded population of Florida scrub jays at Archibald Biological Station in Central Florida. And this population has been studied since 1969, uh, making it one of the longest continuously studied population of vertebrates in North America. And here we really uh, heavily monitor the population. So we conduct monthly censuses where we go out and count every single individual uh, that we've uh, marked in the population. Um, we find almost all nests that occur on the, um, on the study track. And we also are able to map territory boundaries. Um, like I said, they're fiercely territorial um, and they have a very distinct uh, undulating territorial display at the boundary. So that's where I were able to go out and physically draw lines on, on the map to see where each group resides. Um, and here is sort of showing you two photo, uh, photos of my advisor. So on the left is John Fitzpatrick, who used to be the director of the Lab of Ornithology, but he's been coming to Archbold since he was 20 years old. Um, so yeah, he's really invested in the system. And on the right is also recently retired, uh, Dr. Reed Bowman, who was the principal investigator for the Avian Ecology Lab at Archbold. And I just wanted to shout out, especially for those students here. So Archbold has a really great internship program. So uh, there's an internship program specifically for postbacs who, you know, right after they graduate from college, they get to go there and experience the whole field season at Archbold. We usually have a group of four to five interns at a time. Um, and they were instrumental in helping collect all of this data. So you get to start you know, from doing the monthly censuses, map territories, uh, find nests, uh, banned nestlings and fledglings and do all that. So 
yeah, if you're ever interested, you know, send me an email, definitely can get you the contact information there. But um, yeah, I just want to do a shout out to the crew that's been helping me um, since I started. Um, back to Scrub Jays. So this is sort of the territory maps uh, that we draw out and monitor. So we monitor about 75 to 85 groups each year. Um, and the territory boundaries tend to be fairly stable. Um, they don't change too much year to year, but every now and then we'll get a new territory popping up or old territory is shrinking or expanding, again, depending on uh, the productivity of the territory um, and also how many helpers they have at a time. And this is sort of what our jays look like and how we capture our jays. So we use baited potter traps, uh, fairly simple traps. So these are uh, the trap doors are propped open by a stick with a string attached. And when once we have the jay that we want to target, uh, we just pull the string and catch the jay. It's fairly, you know, fairly simple but effective. And you can sort of see here sort of the color bands. Um, that's how we are able to identify individuals and keep track of their survivor. Uh, survival and reproductive success. So um, for a young forest scrub jay, so they typically have these two options, right? They can either delay dispersal at home, meaning that they'll breed later, but they might get some indirect fitness benefits there because they're helping out their parents or, or siblings. Um, but I'm, I just wanna point out that this indirect fitness benefit is fairly minor um, when we do, uh, do the calculations, it is actually better to breed yourself than help kin and gain any indirect fitness. Um, but again, just wanted to note that there's some benefits there. Or they could disperse, which meaning that they can they will breed sooner and directly produce their own offspring. So given their options, I wanted to know, you know who disperses um, and what social environmental factors can help explain these dis different dispersal decisions. Uh, luckily, we already know quite a lot about dispersal in the species. Like I said, we studied them for 50 years. Um, and like many other bird species, Florida scrub jays exhibit sex bias and dispersal with females dispersing earlier and farther than males. And there's also a strong fitness advantage for short distance dispersal. So I'm gonna show you a table. It's a little complicated, but, oops, sorry. Basically it's showing that um, if you are able to inherit the territory or disperse you know, within one territory way, you, have, you produce the highest number of uh, uh, fledglings, independent yearlings, as well as have uh, much longer breeding years. And this is true for, uh, it's the effect stronger for males, but it holds true for uh, females as well. <clears throat> so um, given that I wanted to understand, you know, which factors may affect, uh, which social and environmental factors may affect their decisions to either disperse or stay home. So I looked at different innate factors and external factors he, uh, shown here, and this was based on the literature. Um, and again, this was assuming that there are these innate differences that exist for benefits of staying. So um, there might be differences based on sex or age or hatch date here, uh, meaning birds that hatch earlier in the year usually have more access to resources and thus are able to be in better condition and be more competitive. Um, sex, like I mentioned, there is this sex bias and dispersal. So I, uh, I was thinking that, again, we might see those uh, differences there. And age, sort of similar to hatch date. So older jays are probably more likely to be more competitive uh, and uh, may uh, be more inclined to disperse as opposed to staying at home. Um, also looked at different social factors. So looked at uh, social dominance and parental nepotism. So um, here I'm using the uh, within group rank. So especially among same sex siblings, like how more dominant are you within the group? Because again, if you're more dominant, you're more likely to sort of outcompete your uh, subordinate siblings and gain access to breeding spaces. And for step parents here, um, I mentioned earlier that there is these parental nepotism benefits. So unrelated parents would be less likely to support their um, an unrelated offspring. So perhaps if by having a step parent, you're less likely to stay at home as that might be beneficial for you to disperse earlier on. And last, uh, I want to look at resource availability because um, perhaps if you have lots of resources available at, at the natal territory, there might be less competition or maybe less pressure for you to disperse. 
Um, or it could be that you may gain a lot of resources earlier on and that which will make you more competitive uh, when it comes to dispersal. So sort of had these um, hypotheses and predictions beforehand, but we weren't really sure which direction it might go. So when we first looked at dispersal probability based on these different variables, um, we, oh, first I saw that there were these two uh, peaks in dispersal. So when we mapped all the occurrences of dispersal throughout the month, uh, throughout the year, sorry, um, we saw that there was one peak around March. This is right at the start of the breeding season. There was one at around August, which was right at the end of the breeding season. So it seems like there's two times when dispersal occurs. So when I was looking at dispersal, uh, we sort of split the year into what we call these two semesters. Um, and that was sort of our time reference as to when dispersal occurs. So um, I used demography data for about 35 years to understand you know, which factors may affect dispersal. Um, and when we saw that, uh, we saw the correlates of these, uh, these different factors uh, varied by sex, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, like I mentioned before, um, females are the dispersing sex in this species. So here I'm going to show you what are called survival plots. Um, and basically what she's showing is that the x-axis is, is, is time. So like I said, these are semesters of dispersal. So starting from the hatch year, their first spring, first fall, second spring, second fall sort of goes that way. But it's basically just like time and age um, passing. And the y-axis is showing the probability of remaining. So basically how many birds remain um, at home at, during those time points. So, you know, unsurprisingly at their hatch year, most, almost all birds are at home. And as they get older or as time passes, they start to leave home more so. So here you can see that um, the males are, the, the curve is a bit higher than the females, meaning that they tend to stay for a bit longer even as they get older, whereas females are leaving home a lot sooner than the males do. Again, which isn't surprising, but this was just a different way of looking at the data that we already had. And we saw that um, for, uh, when it came to factors affecting dispersal decisions, we saw that in only male helpers, the presence of a step parent, especially a same sex step parent, and a resource availability on the male territory had a significant effect on whether a bird disperses or not. So, birds that had a stepfather, meaning that their biological father was replaced, were more likely to leave, um, and they left at a sooner age, as seen in this darker line here for the males. Um, and for scrub habitats, it's kind of hard with the different lines, but basically birds that were hatched in high quality habitat with lots of scrub habitat available, they were uh, more likely to stay as opposed to leave. Um, you can see that in the uh, graph there. Um, and females, we didn't see any of these effects. So it seems like uh, dispersal decisions were sort of irrelevant to these different factors. Um, so this sort of answers, you know, who gets to disperse. I also want to understand, you know, who dispersed far distances. Again, because dispersal distance had such a strong fitness um, consequence, I want to understand, you know, who are the birds that are going these far distances. So I use fairly similar uh, predictors as before, but instead it replaced the step parent with a number of competitors because I was thinking that uh, all, if there is a breeding vacancy that opens up close to home, all the competitors or you know, same sex helpers in the area are going to compete for that same breeding position uh, vacancy. So I figured that might affect this course of distance. Um, and when I looked at uh, the results, we saw that uh, the only significant factors were sex and age. So again, females were the ones that were dispersing farther distances here. Um, and this was sort of truth, whether regardless of the age that, that they dispersed at. Um, but there were also, uh, uh, the younger birds were the ones that di were dispersing farther distances. And you can see sort of the birds that disperse in their hatch year. So this is right after the hatch year between the first uh, spring, they actually move really, really far distances, um, which was quite surprising given that these are fairly sedentary birds. Uh, they don't, they're not great flyers, so they don't move that far. Um, and I just want you to sort of keep in mind these, you know, really young birds that are moving really far distances. Um, and while other predictors weren't significant, we saw that at least in females within group dominance did also have an effect. So birds that were more subordinate within the group were also dispersing further distances. So yeah, it was interesting to see these different sex uh, 
based, I guess, uh, responses in terms of what, which factors affected their dispersal decisions. So just to summarize, uh, it seems like females disperse sooner and farther than males, um, which again, isn't surprising. We've already known that from previous studies, but it, what's interesting to note is that um, these sex-based effects differ between whether you're a female helper or a male helper. So only for males, uh, male helpers tended to disperse more when they had a stepfather and when they were born in low quality territories. And it seemed like this sort of delayed dispersal was see is sort of an active strategy for what we think are dominant individuals, because if you delay dispersal, you're able to disperse much shorter distances, which again, translate to having a higher fitness outcome later on. Um, whereas the subordinates of the group, especially for females, they're sort of, they sort of have to resort to leaving sooner and moving farther distances, perhaps to look for better breeding uh, opportunities elsewhere. So um, sort of based on that, uh, again, I wanted to see, you know, why are there these two types of dispersal, especially given, it seems like there are these birds that leave home really early on and move farther distances. Um, and there are birds that sort of stay home and get to disperse closer to home. And, you know, this was really perplexing for a while, but the more time I spent in the field, I was sort of started to get an inkling of sort of what was happening um, it, within the forest graduate groups. So, just to demonstrate, um, so here is a scrubje group, um, and here you can sort of be able to identify who you know each individual is. So, um, dad is the one with the yellow and, and line bands, and on the left is his daughter uh, or female helper. And you can also tell the fledgling; they tend to have these grayish brown heads. Um, and for this group that I was monitoring, there was uh, one neighboring helper that was always coming to visit and the more I saw them he was spending less time at home and spending more time with this group um, but it seemed like he was sort of bumming off of the group he was uh, like the daughter helper would feed the fledgling and the help the neighboring helper would come over and steal food from the fledgling's mouth that, was, that got just fed um, but you know despite that it was still participating in you know the group's activity so it was helping with sentineling behavior, territorial defense and all that. And so, and such cases were not uncommon. Every year I'd see, you know, one or two groups that had these, you know, neighboring helpers that sort of moved in with the group and was uh, sort of partaking in this group's activity. So, you know, got me thinking, what's up with these uh, unrelated helpers? Uh, when I went back to the Forest Scrub J literature, so this was the book published in 1984, which is sort of like the Scrub J Bible at the time, um, and there's the only mention of this behavior was in a small section on uh, adopted helpers that seem to join another group, especially when their own natal group disintegrates, usually through a breeder dying. Um, however, the cases that I've seen in the field didn't quite fit in this category as the those adopted helpers or unrelated helpers still had intact family groups. Um, so I want to understand what was going on here. So if you step back a little bit, there's actually uh, quite a few instances of um, these uh, circumstances where groups are comprised of both kin and non-kin. So actually in 30% of cooperative breeding birds, uh, they actually have groups that comprise of both relatives and un unrelated uh, members, members. And while uh, ecological constraints for kin selection, like I mentioned earlier on, they tend to explain you know, why kin-based groups form, they don't, they're unable to explain why these mixed kin-based groups also exist. And there are, you know, various um, hypotheses as to why that might happen. So uh, by residing with unrelated members, they might gain some direct fitness benefits because they can mate with these unrelated members. They can also avoid kin competition. And they can also benefit from what's called group augmentation, meaning that birds in larger groups tend to uh, be more beneficial in terms of predator avoidance, you know, more eyes to look for predators, and also be better at territorial defense. Again, more members to um, sort of participate in, in uh, territorial activities. So again, it seems like there are these, uh, it's a bit more complicated than what we thought, and offspring may have to um, bounce out even more, you know, different cost benefit trade-offs um, when it comes to dispersing. So Going back to our scrub jays, it seems like 
there's this third option of dispersing. So instead of you know, delaying dispersal or dispersing directly, you may be able to move elsewhere as a helper, um, but it's unclear as to why, what might be the benefits of, of this. So um, I wanted to understand uh, what was happening here. So I sort of broke down all our dispersing for ScribJs into these sort of distinct life stage categories. And I want, I, um, categorize different sort of paths to dispersal. So um, starting from uh, independent young that sort of reaches nutritional independence and they survive their first winter to become a yearling that can either directly disperse and become a breeder at a, at a territory or they can engage in what we define as staging. So when a helper disperses to a non-natal territory with unrelated breeders uh, as a helper there. And um, I was looking through the monthly census data, we saw that actually almost 28% of yearlings engage in the st staging strategy, which was a really high number that we just didn't expect from before. Um, so when we looked at around uh, 1400 birds that reached nutritional independence, about uh, 980 of them survived their first year. And then of those, about 274 of them were seen at a different territory. And of these sort of staging individuals, we saw that they were on average 1.4 territories, meaning that they, were, um, they weren't just staying at one territory, but they were also bouncing around different territories before they finally um, became a breeder or they disappeared or likely died at, at that different territory. Um, and so I wanted to look at you know, different characteristics of like, you know, what were these staging birds doing that differed from birds that directly dispersed? We saw that staging birds were the ones that dispersed sooner and dispersed farther as well. So here, um, the staging birds are indicated in yellow and the direct dispersers, again, the birds that stay at home and then disperse to become a breeder are in blue. You can see that the staging birds are dispersing at a much younger age and are the ones dispersing further distances. And this made sense, so especially given the figure that I showed you before, these really young birds that were dispersing really far distances were likely engaged in the staging behavior, sort of using these non-natal territories as a stepping stone to get to their final sort of breeding destination. I want to you know, understand uh, what the departure conditions look like for these staging birds. So use similar uh, variables as before. We saw that for male stagers, they tended to be, they were more likely to stage when there was a lot of competitors on the natal territory. So when there were a lot of male helpers, they were more likely to stage. Um, and surprisingly, they were also more at the stage when there's a lot of scrub habitat available. So meaning that there, if there was a lot of resources, they were also more likely to stage. Um, females sort of had a different response. So females responded to their father. So whether they had a father or not, so a biological father, um, birds that were, that did not, that, that lost their biological father were more likely to stage. Um, and uh, similar to males, birds that had a lot high quality territories or were coming from high quality territories were also more likely to stage. Um, so it made sense for the males, you know, it seemed like if they're responding to competition, if there's a lot of competition at home, you know, it's better to at least stage at a different territory to look for breeding opportunities elsewhere. And for females, it seemed like um, once their father was missing, it seemed like their either their mothers or their uh, stepmother sort of perceived them as competitors and were more likely to kick them out, sort of say, or maybe they might be perceived as competition and just you know, receive more pressure there. But yeah, there was some effects there. As for uh, resource availability, we figured that um, there's something more happening that we aren't able to capture. So I actually wanted to compare conditions home versus the conditions that they were staging at to see you know, what are the differences there. So when I looked at um, habitat quality and quantity uh, and as well as competition, we saw that stagers joined groups with fewer competitors. So again, just looking at birds that stage, comparing their, the attributes of their natal territory versus their staging territory. See that um, uh, only the number of same-sex helpers uh, mattered. So, um, for both males and females, they were both joining territories that basically had zero same-sex helpers or competitors. So it seems like the strategy is more about sort of getting rid of competitors and making sure you're sort of top of the line for any breeding vacancy that might occur. 
Um, and sort of uh, looking at the territory quality here, again, they're not really compromising or going to lower quality territories, it seems like when they're moving from home to these next territories. So even though these birds are coming from really high quality, quality, quality territories, um, just the fact that they're not, they're still going to, you know, a comparable territory with comparable um, resource availability, it seems like they are still, you know, in somewhat good condition that they um, uh, seem to be, you know, sort of in human terms, be able to be picky in terms of which territories they're going to and not lose any of those resource benefits. Um, and last, when I looked at, uh, I looked at the different reproductive outcomes of staging versus direct dispersers. So I looked at age at first breeding, number of breeding seasons alive, and total number of fledgings produced. And we saw that um, for all counts, male stagers did significantly worse than uh, than direct dispersers. So male stagers tended to um, breed at a much later age, they had shorter breeding seasons, and ultimately that fewer number of fledglings produced. So it seems like sort of a best of a bad job for males, meaning that, you know, they're probably avoiding competition at home to go to a different territory where, you know, they're achieving at least some fitness rather than zero fitness, uh, where there's just, when, if there's too many competitors at home and they just have zero breeding opportunities. On the other hand, for females, it seems like it's more of a comparable um, alternative strategy. Uh, again, it makes sense given that they are the dispersing sex. So perhaps staging is just one other way to you know, achieve that goal of dispersing and produce young. So just to sort of uh, wrap up this chapter, so we saw that there are these alternative dispersal paths that exist in forest scrub jays. Um, helpers tended to stage at groups with fewer competitors, and it seems it sort of uh, aligns with um, our understanding of these social cues for breeding opportunities. So it seems like they're sort of skipping ahead in line, especially if there's a lot of competition at home. Um, they're able to move to a group, but there's fewer competition for these breeding uh, vacancies. And again, there's these sex differences that we see here where uh, staging is more of a best of a bad job for males. Um, it's not an ideal uh, scenario because they lose some reproductive fit, uh, benefits, but still better than having zero, if, especially if you're sort of bottom of the, of the pecking order at home. Um, but for females, which is again, which are the dispersing sex, this was more of a comparable strategy. So yeah, it was really exciting to see uh, that, uh, to I guess quantify and um, cate categorize this type of dispersal behavior for the species. Um, so sort of moving on to uh, the last part I want to share with you today. So I want to understand how prospecting varies among individuals and just explain to you what I mean by prospecting. So for a flora scrub jay, for honestly any other vertebrates um, and not invertebrates as well, we know that these, there are these various social and environmental factors that correlate with dispersal decisions. So a uh, florist scrub jay, a young florist scrub jay needs to really think about, you know, all these different factors when it comes to uh, dispersal decisions and uh, going to different breeding, um, uh, gaining different breeding opportunities. So they need to assess you know, maybe the fire history of the territory, understand what competitors or potential mates are out there, think about, uh, you know, how much uh, acorn production is going on there look for nesting spots and so forth. Um, and in order for a young jay to sort of gain all this insight on their landscape, um, they participate in this behavior called prospecting, which is this behavioral process of gathering information around one's, surround, uh, around one's surroundings. Um, and this happens you know, often by having a, a bird sort of depart from the Neo territory and explore all the occupied territories nearby before returning to sort of the safety of their home. Um, and again, this allows individuals to discern different social and environmental cues that are beneficial for dispersal, as well as uh, subsequent uh, reproductive success. Um, but this uh, information is, uh, diff uh, sorry, this behavior is, difficult to monitor in the wild owing to difficulties of tracking animal behavior, like I said before. Um, so, uh, you know, despite that, I still want to understand, uh, 
you know, how does prospecting occur and whether, how does that affect subsequent dispersal? Because again, dispersal has such an important fitness outcome. Um, I really want to tie those two together. So if we are able to quantify prospecting at a finer scale, um, I want to really understand how does prospecting vary among individuals and does that ultimately result in these differences, differences we see in, when it comes to dispersal decisions. Um, and, you know, I've been saying this before, but the largest hurdle with studying animal movement has been uh, size limits of these tracking devices. They're oftentimes too bulky, as you can see on the seal, they tend to be really large in size and you either have to compromise um, the, uh, the quality or the resolution of the data, so how fine of a scale you're going at versus how often the data point can be transmitted. So there's always been this a huge drawback and difficulties in studying birds, especially really song, really small songbirds where, you know, where there is that weight limit. Um, but there has been, fortunately, during my PhD, a lot of uh, technological advances that have helped me sort of, you know, do my project. Um, and one of that was uh, this uh, life tag tracking system developed by cellular tracking technologies. So um, as you can see here, the tags, uh, this is sort of a graphic of it, but it sits, these are really small tags that are less than 1% of the, the bird's body weight total, and they are powered by solar. Um, those so have solar panels that power the tags, so they don't need any batteries that add that extra weight. But basically how the system works is that you put out a grid of receiver nodes and a main sensor station. So the life tags um, that receive sunlight will emit signal every five seconds, which are then picked up by a grid of receiver nodes, uh, which then ultimately relay all that data into a centralized sensor station, which then uploads the data onto the cloud where you can download the data and just from the office. Um, but by basically having a grid of receiver nodes, you're able to sort of uh, capture different signal strengths at each of the, the nodes and you're able to sort of triangulate where exactly each tag is coming from. And then you take sort of uh, time-based averages. So you do like five minute averages of like where the tag is and sort of uh, see how the tag uh, or the tagged individual moves throughout the landscape. Um, and this was, uh, I think this was one of the first or second times the system was used at such a large scale. So I'm here, I'm just showing you the first set of data that we received after deploying these tags for just a week. Um, and we tagged nine different individuals indicated in the different colors here. Um, and I think this was using uh, five minute averages. And you can see we just got a lot of different you know, location points. Seems like the birds are, are fairly busy. And I was able to sort of translate, uh, add a temporal element to it and look at um, how fast the birds are moving throughout time. So this again is nine different tagged birds um, moving across the landscape in just a couple of hours. And you know, you can see birds, they're quite busy. They're mostly restricted to what their natal territories are, but um, this just gave us a really tremendous opportunity to look at how much they were moving on such a fine scale. Um, especially with regards to prospecting behavior. So again, these are birds that are not just like in, inside their native territories, you know, looking for resources or, you know, hanging out with their group, but these are birds that are also, you know, ex going outside the boundaries of their native territory and looking for potentially breeding opportunities. Um, and so with these localizations, I created what are called automated kernel density estimates. Um, so these are very crude, I guess, uh, areas of how far these birds um, travel. And so this is one tagged individual that you see here. Uh, I've highlighted its natal territory in this dark blue, so it's coming from the sand territory. Um, I think I used uh, daily averages for this uh, calculation, but it's for, for each of these months. And you can see, you know, they vary quite a lot. So a lot of their uh, movement or time they spend in an area is restricted to their natal territory, but, you know, they tend to explore their surroundings quite a lot. So it was really exciting to see that um, and sort of play around with the data with, at different scales. Um, but this was one way that I sort of approximated uh, prospecting area. So I looked at the total area and sort of subtracted the natal territory from there to look at how far they were prospecting.
And the time of this analysis, I had a total of 405 bird months for 65 individuals that were tagged across uh, around two years. Um, I didn't mention it here, but there was a lot of trial and errors trying to, first trying to get the system started. So a lot of tags falling off, not working. Um, that's why I was sort of limited in, in the scope of that. But um, there's quite a lot of individual repeatability, meaning that birds tended to do the same thing throughout the month, um, which sort of uh, corroborated that the methods were, were correct. And um, a lot of the data that the results I'm going to show you is still pretty preliminary. I'm, I'm working with uh, the new principal um, investigator at Archbold who's taking on this project to analyze this data and try to get it published. Um, but yeah, just, just looking at prospecting area, we saw that females were prospecting much larger areas than males, which is consistent with sex bias and dispersal and not, not super surprising. But we also saw that there was this age effect. So birds that were younger um, indicated in the blue are the ones that prospected much further area, uh, larger areas than these older birds. And this corresponded really well to uh, an a anecdotal, I guess, tracking project that um, Reed Bowman did in I think the 90s, where he saw that uh, younger birds, uh, when fitted with VHF tags, which are the tr traditional like radio tracking telemetry, where you go out with a uh, Yagi and, and look for birds, um, seems like young birds were sort of exploring their entire neighborhood, um, sort of not minding where they're going. Whereas the older helpers, they sort of seem to set have like a set path, so they were hitting the same territories and you know going to one territory or another and sort of returning home. But yeah, it was exciting to see that the new technology was corroborating and supporting that same um, line of work. Um, and this was also true when we looked at like throughout the year. So when we looked at um, across the months, we saw that younger helpers again were or prospecting much further, dis wider distances. Um, and we also saw that there is sort of a slight peak right before the breeding season. So um, which again, it's consistent with the two peaks in dispersal that I showed you earlier. So it seems like right before the breeding season starts, uh, these helpers are really going out there and explore, exploring their surroundings. When breeding season actually starts, you know, they are actually pretty good helpers, like their title, and they tend to stay at home and um, help raise uh, their younger siblings. Um, and then right after breeding season, there's also like another peak, especially uh, right around the fall time. Um, but yeah, so. Um, we had some technical difficulties, I think, in, in uh, May and June, um, and we also had a really big fire burn through a lot of the study tracks. So yeah, there, again, it came with some technical difficulties, but it's still really cool to see um, these differences. So um, just to sort of wrap this up, we saw that females and younger helpers were the ones prospecting much larger areas than males or older helpers. Um, prospecting area seems to be maximized just before and after the breeding season, which coincides with dispersal. Um, but future work would really, uh, I would really like to directly compare how prospecting effort um, corresponds to dispersal outcomes. Um, so yeah, just to you know quickly summarize everything that I talked about before. So it seems like young subordinate birds that face reduced breeding opportunities, uh, likely due to increased competition, are the ones that leave home early and move further distances. Um, staging away from home seems to be an alternative dispersal strategy, especially for the dispersing sex, females, um, but only for uh, only a, a best of a bad job strategy for subordinates for the stay at home sex or the males. Um, it seems like prospecting does perceive dispersal in almost all individuals, but it does, again, vary by sex and age. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to continue uh, exploring uh, the, this data set and looking at different factors um, like, you know, competition, uh, other helpers in the area and so forth. Um, so with that, I have a lot of people to thank for, you know, everything I've done for my dissertation chapter. Got a lot of great funding sources that help uh, uh, with different aspects of my project. Um, but uh, sort of, I also wanted to sort of pick up where I left on on how I, I got to this position here. So, you know, while this was happening, so every spring semester, I would go down to Florida and collect behavioral data on the Florida scrub jays. But in the fall, I was actually pretty involved in, muse uh, in different aspects of museum work. So there was a prep lab taught by the curator of the CUMV, which is the Cornell University Museum of Vertebrates. And um, so every Friday would be just prep lab. I would go in and prep birds, which you know I really fell in love with. 
And uh, I got to know the creator really well. And we decided to work on a, a small project involving uh, Baltimore and Bullock's Orioles, especially these Bullock's Orioles at um, the Harbid Zone. So you can see on sort of the left line here, it's cut out, but these are birds collected in the 50s. And the birds on the right line are birds collected in uh, 2021, I believe. And you can, you know, I hope it's obvious, but you can see that these modern bullets orioles tend to be a lot more orange or so I want to see, you know, if that was actually true from a more color perspective. Um, just a quick background of these birds, uh, the bullets and the Baltimore hybridize in this uh, in the plains, great plains region here. And this is sort of the sampling transect that they have for these two, you know, uh, collection groups of, of these uh, Bullock's Orioles. So um, again, this was just in the fall, the side, you know, project that I thought be, you know, quick and easy. But basically, I, this was the first time I was, I got to use museum specimens. So I measured um, the, uh, use the spectrometer to measure different color metric variables on this. And basically just found that the modern Bullocks and Baltimores look more similar, especially in terms of how orange they are. So these are what are called PCA plots. So sort of if we were to uh, combine all the different color variables into just distinct dots on a plane, you can, it sort of looks at you know, similar things are lumped together as opposed to more distinct things. You can see that um, it's a little complicated here, but on the left are all historic samples. So Purple are the Baltimores and the orange are the Bullocks. You can see the historical specimens aren't as alike, but as you get to the more modern specimens, the Bull the Baltimores are becoming look more similar. So that's basically what we found. And um, you know, this was a pretty simple project, but I really fell in love with the idea of using historical specimens to you know, go back in time and understand you know, what was happening. So um, when this position came up, I, you know, it was just really unexpected. It was my fifth year of my PhD. And at that point, I knew I wanted to do, you know, some research, but I didn't, I didn't want that to be my main you know, career path. I like teaching, but it was, you know, pretty stressful for me. So I was looking for some type of alternative. And when I read the job description for this position, I it immediately ticked all the boxes, you know, I got to work with specimens, I do specimen prep. Um, I got to do a lot of public education and outreach, which was so is one of my favorite aspects of anything research related on um, being able to you know relay what we find you know behind the scenes to the public that's always such a fun and exciting aspect of it so yeah applied and you know I also ever since I was a child I was a huge museum nerd um like I said I didn't have a lot of access to you know wildlife but um, I remember my parents taking me to a lot of different natural history museums and I just was always so enamored by the different bird mounds so yeah, being able to work here has definitely been like a dream come true. And yeah, I'm filling in some big shoes, but I'm very, very excited to be here. So yeah, it was definitely a lot of luck uh, involved coming to this place. Um, but yeah, I'm incredibly happy. Uh, but moving forward in this position, you know, I still want to be actively involved in specimen prep. Um, uh, also sort of wanted to pick up on what Kimball's been doing for, you know, for so long, but really understand urban birds. So I showed, it very early, but um, one of my first projects I did at UC Davis was studying urban crows um, at, at Davis. And so I still am always interested in how organisms interact with their environment, especially in a, an environment that's ever so changing and ever so dynamic. Um, and LA is just like the perfect place to study urban birds. So I want to really continue that. That's why I've been continuing the garden survey. But I do want to add sort of another element there and, and introduce, I try to get uh, bird banding started there. So I've been going out a few banding trips with different uh, master banders in the area and hoping to submit a uh, banding permit soon. But yeah, I'm hoping to sort of add that as another element in studying urban birds at the uh, nature gardens at, at, at the, the museum ground. So those are sort of my main focuses I would like to um, really work on moving forward. Um, and yeah, also, you know, want to highly encourage any of any folks out there who want to come prep specimens. Uh, I love teaching uh, specimen prep to anyone who's interested in, even if you just, you know, want to come in once and, you know, ch test it out and see if it's your cup of tea. I know it's not for everyone, but yeah, definitely reach out. I'd love to, you know, be that source. Um, and hopefully the volunteer program at the, at the museum is going to be opening up soon for any, uh, open up to the broader public. So yeah, definitely, um, 
keep us in mind with that. Um, and of course, if you see, find any dead birds, uh, if you could donate it to the museum, that would be fantastic. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's all I had. And it was a lot of slides and uh, whirlwind of information, but yeah. Thank well, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful, wonderful program. And we are excited to have you at the museum. And as you said, you have some very big shoes to fill, but I have a feeling that you'll do an admirable job. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. So anybody who has questions, please put them in the Q&A. And I see two. Um, so one is from Robin, who asks, uh, where is the Archibald Biological Station in Florida? Mm -hmm. um, and the second part of the question is, where were you raised? You didn't say. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I guess I, meant, I missed that. So Archibald Biological Station is in Venus, Florida. It's it's pretty central. It's like two hours south of Orlando. It's really in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, the station's been there forever. They have a accompanying um, agroecology ranch next to it. So yeah, it's a pretty active research site, but just hasn't kind of off the map. But um, yeah, and I was raised in South Korea. Sorry, Seoul, South oh, Korea. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say the uh, Thank you. the picture you showed us didn't exactly look like Southern California, but <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I totally forgot that part. Thanks for pointing Great, thank out. you. Um, so Thomas asks, how do you quantify high quality territories, type of food, number of food trees, number of insects? Yeah, so um, we use uh, usually uh, we usually use two measures. So we use the total area of scrub habitat in the, in the area. So um, at Archibald, we have uh, mapped out the habitat types for every like five by five meter grid uh, for the entire study track. So we're able to quantify, you know, what is oak scrub habitat. And that's sort of been the sort of golden rule of what we use for territory quality or habitat quality. Um, we also used a uh, uh, number of um, years since the last fire to sort of as a measure of like habitat quality compared to just like pure quantity but um surprisingly enough it hasn't ever been a significant predictor as far as I know um it's been quite weird because we know like I showed you the figure before of like the experimental plot where it's like time since fire and we see those groups like increase and decrease so we know that scrub jays are responding to fire but we haven't been able to find like a really good measure of fire history per se and how that affects uh flora scrub jay like productivity or reproductive success. So um, one of my colleagues, she did her master's project on using LIDAR, which is this like, uh, I guess, laser system where you fly like a drone over a habitat and it measures like habitat structure. So she's been quantifying like fire history and habitat structure and how that, uh, how they correlate with each other. And, and we're thinking that habitat structure is more of an important predictor than just fire history itself. So oh, yeah, hmm. stay tuned for that research. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Another how many question from Liga. Yeah. How many helpers per breeding pair and range? And do any pairs breed successfully without helpers? Yeah. So that's a great question. So uh, most groups have, I think on average, like one helper is usually the most uh, common number of helpers, but they can get up to, I think the largest group I've seen there was up to like eight scrub jays and I know they can get larger. So it can be like one to six helpers at a time. Wow. Um, yeah, and usually the larger groups tend to, are the ones that defend um, larger territories. So there's that correlation here. As the groups get larger, they're expanding more territories, which results in more helpers and, and stuff like that. So, and but you know, there's still a lot of pairs that can breed successfully without any helpers. Um, and, but it does seem like just again, based on these staging helpers, um, you know, we, I was only looking at from the helpers perspective, but you can also think about it from the breeding pairs perspective, right? They are also allowing these unrelated helpers to join their group. So it seems like there is that group augmentation benefit where having even one helper, even if, if it's unrelated to them, it still provides them some benefit there. So it seems like, yes, they can raise young without helpers, but they, would prefer to have helpers, especially if their territories are are large enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so Lily asks, have there been behavioral studies 
done on family groups of Florida scrub jays. Not sure what. Um, what what I'm not sure what what you mean, Lily, about the behavioral studies, other than. Yeah, I mean, I could like list various behavioral studies. So yeah, you know, go we've for had it. people <laughs> studying like sentinel behavior. So how well the breeding pair can like time like their sentineling together. Yeah, a um, uh, foraging behavior. Oh yeah, there's. Oh, I guess. You know what I always found so funny was that like for the Western scrub jays, so the California Island and um, Woodhouses, like I feel like a lot of that research has been focused on like caching behavior with like acorns or how many uh, acorns they mm -hmm. can cache and mm -hmm. um, more broader like population genetics. But I, there hasn't been as much like just for behavior focused studies. So it's always been interesting to me thinking about you know why isn't there cooperative breeding in, in these you know, Western Afalakama jays? Um, and I, one of my colleagues used to work on the island jays and he told me that um, in one of the years, he actually had one group that of three birds, it seems like they did have a helper that was helping. So no. maybe it is a pretty flexible behavior, maybe just a matter of like how often it occurs depending on different, you know, climate conditions of the year or you know who knows what's happening or the population level wide like maybe if right. the area is too saturated then they resort to helping um but yeah it's definitely that uh different and um so for the scrub jays at archibald we also do um a lot of uh what we call like personality testing so we used to mm -hmm. measure um, like neophobia which is the fear of foreign objects um so yeah. basically we put like food out and like different like dog toys or baby toys and see how uh, bold they are when it comes to approaching, you know, risking that this like foreign object and approaching it. And there is a lot of literature suggesting that this type of like fear response correlates to, you know, how aggressive you are when it comes to defending your territory or, or acquiring a territory. So we're looking at that briefly. Um, you know, the also another part of this post back internship program is that each intern gets to come up with their own pro, uh, project research projects so a lot of times interns will you know come up with these really novel you know, behavioral <laughs> questions and yeah test them so yeah it's been super fun seeing all the different you know questions that come from that project cool thank you and thank you lily for the question Thanks, lily. um uh gregory asked do uh other scrub jays like california island and i guess woodhouses etc have similar behaviors with helpers prospecting dispersal and so on yeah. Yeah, so um, like I mentioned before, like so the norm is that they they don't have helpers. Like California and Island scrub jays don't. They just you know have their just a breeding pair, and as soon as the young um, become nutritionally independent, um, I can't actually speak for the California ones, but the Island scrub jays, it seems like they the young of the year sort of form these flocks, and they sort of travel together and look for I don't know. I think they just are able to avoid. Uh, aggression from a lot of the territory holding breeders and they get to sort of explore together before mm. um, and they survive sort of the winter and then they get to breed but they don't typically they don't stay at home and help um, but so mm. yeah it's assumed that all all scrub jays and basically all birds sort of engage in this prospecting behavior where they're looking around before they disperse and but the mechanism sim seems to vary so there's um like for instance, there was a study on acorn woodpeckers, which is another, I guess, common local species here, which used a similar technology, but um, they put a receiver node at a granary to look at, you know, which birds were sort of going where. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like these helpers were um, oftentimes, you know, they would go, um, there was like a breeding vacancy and the breeders were, would start to like fight for this opening. They would all go and sort of watch the fight. So there were these like spectators <laughs> that was, you know, those that were actually like engaged in like territory wars. Um, and that, that paper was really interesting because it seemed like even breeders would often sort of leave their own territories to go watch. So it seems like this information gathering process is, is really, really important for, um, for these acre woodpeckers. So they would even risk leaving their own homes like vacant to you know watch and see you know who are the competitors of the area you know why is, is the territory they're competing for is it high quality stuff like that so again this a lot of it's like assumed that it happens 
for many, many animals, but yeah, we just haven't been able to capture that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. Um, let's see, any other questions? I think that I got is... one. Oh, here we go, Lance. Yeah, so I'm I'm curious about the population of Florida scrub jays. Um, is there really room for the population to expand? I mean, like what fraction of potential territories are already occupied? Yeah, so um, basically all the territories are completely occupied. So it's a fairly saturated habitat. Um, every year there will be maybe like a handful of new territories that form. So they'll sort of uh, like fight between several territories, you know, they'll start kind of appearing. And oftentimes those, te those territories fail because they're like first time breeder, they don't know what they're doing, they don't have any helpers. So they'll sort of form in this, in this early spring and sort of uh, disappear um, if they fail to breed. Um, but every now and then they're also, um, I didn't explain it because I didn't have time, but uh, sure. males will engage in this budding behavior. So um, if a father gets like a lot of territory, he'll um, sort of give a section off to the son um, it's usually the most dominant sun, but they'll sort of take it off a front. And that's why we call it budding. It's like from this large territory, they take a sec section of it. And the father continues to help um, defend that territory until the sun is like fully established and has a mate. And that bond stays for a really long time until the females sort of get tired of each other and they start you know, fighting between groups. So yeah, that's, those are like the few cases territories um, occur, but for the most part, yeah, it's like fully saturated. That's why you know there's so many helpers. Um, and that's why I also think it's like unique to this system as opposed to maybe the Western Jays where it might have been evolved in a much different um, environment where there wasn't as much competition. Well, that begs the obvious question of when there was more habitat, whether this type of behavior was happening. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. But um, so our tool, it's like the second largest population. The largest population in Florida is Ocala National Forest, which covers fairly large tract of land, but, you know, still pretty, pretty similar. Um, yeah, it's always interesting to think, you know, what was the ancestral trait? Like, it's hard to compare because the environment's changed so much. But, you know, I also like to think California is also fairly developed, you know, probably as much as Florida. Um, but I do think, yeah, it will be interesting to compare though, like uh, especially fire history, like Florida versus California. That's what we've been thinking for the longest time. Like even though California is also a fire prone system, Florida is definitely, I think like how fires occur and like how that affects habitat patches vary a lot. Um, well, it doesn't yeah. seem like California scrub jay is as uh, habitat specific as the Florida scrub jay. Mm, is that, that correct? Too, yeah, I I think so. Yeah, honestly, I haven't looked at California scrub jays as much, but um, I did want to point out though. So, uh, in addition to Archbold, we do have monitor another population that's in a naturally fragmented area. So it's on a it's on a bombing range, but it, the, the habitat there, the landscape there, naturally is like comprised of these scrub patches that are um surrounded by uh like Freighters. wetlands yeah it's like uh, <laughs> um and like these pine forests that sort of separate each of the territory types and or the habitat types and even there it's like fairly similar um although the biggest difference is that once they uh, so I showed you in, in RJs, like, especially when they're doing the staging behavior, once they can like bounce from different territories for the bobbing range population, it seems like once they move, they're sort of set there. They're like, okay, I'm not going to move anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be again, like, cause there's cross crossing that matrix is such a high risk that they're just like not willing to do it again. Um, but yeah, there's also mm -hmm. a lot of people sort of picking up on that work to do more like comparative stuff there. So yeah, it's a great question though. I don't know. It's always interesting, interesting to think about like how animals evolved, like what sure. kind of ancestral state they were in. Um, but from my knowledge, I, I think the Walkland Jays, the ancestral trait is social systems. Mm -hmm. And then the Western Jays became more solitary, but. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mark, I think a couple of other questions. I see Ken, yeah, I see a question from Ken about 
related about territories. Um, I guess it's, uh, since everything is saturated, our territory is getting smaller to accommodate dispersal or great fledgling years. Um, or is delayed dispersal due to fewer available territories, thus creating helpers? Yeah, so territories only really shrink when there are um but they like sort of lose their helpers and they're not as uh i guess competitive or be or as aggressive when it comes to territorial defense yeah. um so it seems like when they're when the population is doing really well that you just result in like many many more helpers and um the helpers will try sort of in the earlier to create these new territories what we call the nova territories but um again i feel like well we know that they don't they're not super successful so um, even year by year, it's more like the productivity of that year to, translates to just having more helpers per territory rather than having territories sort of um, get smaller overall, because they're still like, they're still maintaining that territory, um, regardless of how many birds there are. So yeah, mm. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, late dispersal due to... Okay fewer available territories. So yeah, but basically because it is such a saturated system, it seems like delayed dispersal is is um is a reason for why it evolved. Um so they're as they're sort of waiting out for these breeding opportunities. Um yeah, if that makes sense. And uh it, it's very rare though, but we do see every now and then we'll see birds that leave our study track or birds that aren't banded come into our study track. So um it could also relate to more birds engaging in these really long distance dispersal events um i haven't been uh, so i i use i looked at ear as well as like a random effect for a lot of most of my models but it never showed up as um significant so i don't think it's a really close like association as to like how many birds spurs versus stay depending on like how productive one year is um productive in, in the sense of like how many birds there are total in the population um but it would be interesting to sort of look at this in uh we have a couple years in our in our long-term data set where um what we think we had was like a west Nile pandemic epidemic go through the population yeah. and shrink yeah. our population um i don't think at least when i looked at it i didn't see any really differences other than you know sheer population size declining but yeah, it's definitely interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Great, thank you. And I think we're out of questions. Awesome. Young, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. A lot of people have been commenting on how much they enjoyed it. Thank oh, you again, yeah. we really appreciate it. Yep, thank you and so we much. Can't, we can't wait to have you back and um, maybe you'll uh, be leading a tour uh through the uh specimen section at the la oh that'd be great yeah, yeah i'd love to yeah just send me an email and we'll figure something out great we have, to have our field trip chair on the call so that's good great and <laughs> uh don't forget next week next uh tuesday at seven o'clock we have dave Prexta here he'll be talking about little footballs that are out in the ocean so come and find out what those little footballs are and i think that's it Thank you all very awesome. much. Thank you so much for having me. And thank yep, you thank again, you. Young. We really, really appreciate it. Take care, yeah, everyone. Bye, everyone. Good thank night. You.